Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Prathish Prakash. Prathish is a roboticist with Danfoss Power Solutions. Uh, Prathish, welcome to the pod. Hi. Uh, so it's nice to be on the podcast. Yeah, good to have you. Yeah. So we've only been talking for a few months now, but I thought, um, you know, this is a real like-minded guy and uh, it'd be fun to, uh, to have him on. So... One of the things that uh, I, I really liked about you when we met is that you've also been building things since you were a kid and, and just yeah. love making robots. And so anyone that loves making robots and has been building things since they were a kid is a friend of mine. And uh, yeah, <laughs> good to go. Absolutely, awesome. brother. So what are some of the, uh, I guess maybe we'll start with kind of how you got to Dan Foss because you recently went from like India to Denmark. So yeah. Yeah. That's got to be cool. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, when we came on. Like, what's what's that been like? So it's it's been a journey. So the last last few months have been uh, relocating and getting to know a new culture and all that. So it's it's a really nice journey. So I'm getting settled into the new place. The family is getting settled in, and I'm liking the place. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. No. I mean, and uh, now that you're a you're a Dane, you can you can charge way more money for your time. So. <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, but but the place is nice. The people are very nice. Uh, people are very cordial and helpful, and help you settle in very nicely. That's awesome. I've been wanting to visit Denmark for a while here. Um, it, it seems like you know you guys have an amazing robotic scene, and it's just um, it's been on my radar for so long, and I just haven't had the time to make it out yet. So I don't know. Maybe there's yeah, Copenhagen and and uh, Odense have both. Uh, a great robotic scene and they're kind of the top right now in the world so they have a high, huge density of robotics companies at the same place awesome and, and a lot of that we, uh, from from there we we are actually based out of Norborg, and we are just maybe uh, an hour out hour hour and a half out from Odense. that's awesome that's probably the best of both worlds i would imagine because i'd imagine it's way cheaper than being in Odense, but also yeah. you know you've got all the talent right there so it's it's not just about being cheap. It's it's the the place is really beautiful. The the place is a bit more uh, quietish and and uh, a lot of people are there, but but spread apart in uh, in a nice way. I would I like. It's a very beautiful place to be. That's awesome. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> you Pittsburgh's should come cool too. I absolutely want to. Yeah. No, I, I should and I will. I yeah. think I found uh, there's some kind of. Um, an organization um, here in the States, which I need to figure out who it is so I can actually do it, but they're willing to like subsidize me going anywhere in the world for like a certain amount oh. of money just to promote business. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I, maybe I'm overthinking where I want to go, but there's so many different places I'd like to visit uh, that I would like to, you know, build robots in. And so I just make a list of them. Yeah. That's a good, and then just prioritize, you know, just be like, you yeah. know, which one of these is the highest probability of, of connecting for real business and then, you know, go from there or which is the most fun to visit. But I feel like that would be kind of abusive of the funds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. Denmark seems to be both. So that, that probably would be at the top. Uh, I've been thinking about like Dubai, um, been thinking about uh, Singapore. Um, I don't know. There's there's a few spots in the world that seem like they're they're probably hot for tech development right now. Very active, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like Germany sort of is on the radar, but I feel like they want to make their own stuff. Like they're not really interested in Americans doing their own thing. They're about what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they only speak in their own languages. So, <laughs> but otherwise, Germany is way ahead of all of us. I, uh, the only problem is it's uh, the the language is uh, very critical. They they actually only speak in German most of them. Yeah, when I was looking, when I was graduating from master's school, I was thinking about Switzerland because it seemed like a fun place to work and 
live. Yeah. But every single job I looked at required like fluency in German, and I don't have that yet. So I just yeah, couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I I actually live uh, maybe roughly thirty five kilometers away from the, uh, Gen Germany, so I can oh, cool. basically drive to Germany. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Have you done it yeah. yet? I, mean, I imagine you're just getting your footing in Denmark, but no, no, no not yet. I, I, I'm, I have that on my bucket, bucket list, and there, there, there is a, a boat that goes to Germany uh, every, I think, every evening at four or five, and I want to catch that. It's like you can go to Germany, um, roam around, and come back on the same boat. Yeah, thirty-five kilometers is nothing. You're, you're like right nothing. there. Very close. Very close by. Yeah, yeah for sure. I, um, yeah, I, I heard something, uh, during my last trip to Europe, which I really liked, which is, you know, in America, um, a hundred years is a long time in, um, Europe, a hundred kilometers is a long distance. <laughs> so. so, so the, 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 the thing is most of the stuff is very close by for us, uh, Nordborg and I, I actually live in another city, which is Sonoborg. Sonoborg is like, uh, 20 kilometers away and uh, other than these two places the connectivity is a little bit patchy i mean uh, i mean if i want to go out i have to catch a train or, or or a bus but if you have a vehicle it's good it's it's just a short yeah, drive away it was liberate i mean last time i was i was in europe i i rented a car in the south of france um uh, from con i started there and then i just spent a few days i drove into the alps and then i drove oh. up uh, into uh, Brussels in Belgium, and then I went into, um, I think, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And I mean, awesome. it just, yeah, it's like a two hour drive between those cities. Like, having a car in Europe is amazing. Like, you can you can go anywhere. I mean, it's all, yeah. it's all right and, there. And th th there is no traffic on the roads. The, the roads are awesome. Yeah. Uh, to drive on. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Being American, I had to learn to drive stick for it. <laughs> so <laughs> that was embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I had never driven a stick shift car before, but I had ridden a motorcycle with a uh, manual shift. And okay. so I, um, I learned how to drive stick shift in the parking lot of the rental car place in France. Oh my God. Yeah, it, was, it was really <laughs> bad. And I'm sure they're like the driving. stupid American. <laughs> you know? so. It's like a crash course in driving in 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. And so I, I was just like, I think I smoked the clutch in the parking lot of the rental car place. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't take the car away from me. <laughs> and I was able to do that road <laughs> trip. I also like I, I, I kind of screwed up epically. Like when I was in the Alps, um, you know, my French is not so good. Like it's it's OK. It, I can I can buy things at a store and I can sort of get around and communicate like basic human needs and ask where the bathroom is and all that. But like I, I, I can't have like a deep intellectual conversation and I'm like borderline illiterate. So I um, <laughs> there was a street sign um, that, you know, I think said something, you know, bad on it, uh, but I didn't know what it meant. So I just ignored it. And I drove by it when I was looking for this uh, chalet I was staying at in the French Alps. And um, I ended up <laughs> like on like a uh, like a fire trail, basically, like through the Alps. Like it's it's a miracle. It wasn't the winter because I never would have gotten that car. It was a Fiat uh, 500. Uh, or a Fiat Panda. It was like a little teeny Fiat. I can't remember what it was, but teeny, teeny Fiat. And I, I basically took it off-roading by accident because my French is terrible. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Awesome, awesome. So what's the first robot you ever built? So the first robot that I built was a line-following robot. That was in the year, I think, it was 2000 or 2001, yeah. And uh, it had no microcontrollers, I would say. It was based uh, on a logic controller. So we have AND gates and uh, OR gates. So this was built on that. And it had three ICs. One, I think one was an, a logic IC, one was a motor driving IC, and one was the sensing IC. So I got the circuit from some uh, website that time, and I, I sat down and built it for a week, week and a half nice. and tuned it for two bloody weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's always how it goes. The tuning step always yeah. takes the longest. Yeah. So, so basically making it took me one week and tuning it took me two weeks. So, uh, I was just starting off. So I had no idea what to expect and I was just tinkering around and by, by the end of 
one and a half weeks, I got the knack of it. So the remaining went like a breeze. But the first one and a half weeks was brutal. I didn't know what to do. I was just tinkering around with the tuning resistors and 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 trying to get stuff to work. And because it was made made uh, using an IR LED, I yeah. didn't know if it was working or not. So oh, I, I, I had no idea what was going on there. That's brutal. Yeah. So was the tuning potentiometers, like, was that for, like, the brightness of the IR LED or was that for, like, the sensitivity of the receiver or both? Uh, no, it was uh, the brightness of the IR LED was fixed. Uh, this These resistors were for the sensitivity of the receiver. Nice. So uh, the the IC that was doing uh, doing the uh, IR sensing was Imagine. actually a uh, op amp IC. That's what I was so thinking was, in my head. Yeah. It was basically an op amp IC. I, I, if I remember correctly, I've forgotten the IC number. It was something LM323 or something like that. It was very I'm old. impressed that you even know. Like, I guess I know the LN298 because that's a like common H bridge drive yes, that we use yes. a lot. Yeah, there's a few of them, like the 555 timer. This is this is way before I knew about the generic ICs or triple five ICs or anything. So I had worked with the triple five IC and I had worked with some transistors and all that, but I had I didn't have deep knowledge of how they worked or or even basic idea of how the comparator worked. So I I actually sat down and learned what a comparator did and how it worked and all that, and uh, that's why I was able to tune it without any kind of help from the outside because I I understood how it was working. So by by week one and a half I was like thorough with what what was going on with the resistors and how it was happening and all that so i had a multimeter at hand and i was checking the voltages at the output of the potentiometer and then checking it all on the output of the photo photodiode and uh, that's how i got it working so there was some some hotspot wiring i was not very good at soldering that time so the wiring was very weird so I, I didn't know if the wiring was wrong or the circuit was wrong <laughs> or, or, or or nothing was working i was just firing in the air and then finally it started working and it started working pretty well nice uh, so it was so so uh we we didn't have those uh, so initially you you get gearboxes and you get wheels that connect to gearboxes nowadays but in those days we didn't have any of those so i had to go uh, uh what to say uh i had to find my ways uh, in the market so i actually found a toy that used to have two motors and two gearboxes and four wheels and kind of took it apart. So I would, nice. so every time I wanted to make a robot, I would just go buy that toy. It was way cheaper for me to just get the toy and all the four wheels together. Yeah. It was a cheaper toy, Chinese toy that had, uh, uh, it, it was a wired remote control uh, bucket loader. Oh, that's the best. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the best. So I would remove the bucket loader and I would remove the cabin of the bucket loader and the it would have two sets of motors and uh, four sets of wheels. So it was a skid steer robot. So I would take the uh, 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 motors from there and just solder in motor drivers and it would become a robot. That's that awesome. was how I started. That's really cool. And I, I love the uh, the beam methodology with the uh, the ICs being soldered together. That's also yes. how I started. So my, my first one was... Um, it was even less smart than yours. Like it, it was just two whiskers and it was, just um, a, yeah, just uh, bumping off of things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, I think I used, uh, two double a batteries and then it would go in the middle of the batteries and then it would get one and a half volts by pulling off either one. And so awesome. just the switches on the whiskers would switch the polarity going to the motor, uh, on that whisker and like, reverse it a little bit so it could back out and yeah bump off things it was really fun that, that, that's how simple it was to just design a basic logic into robots so that's that's what got us all started i would say yeah. i mean thinking how 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 simple stuff would work and and how simple stuff would get moving with just basically one neuron firing and telling it not to go there <laughs> and, and thinking of just adding on neurons and making it more intelligent is what got us going. So yeah, uh, a lot of sleep nights after that, but yeah, uh, it still same. drives us around. <laughs> Amen, brother. Well, it's, it's cool. I mean, like you said, like, I mean, I think we all start there. One neuron is a great way to look at it. And then you just kind of build more and more and more complex things. And all of a sudden, yeah. like you're working for Dan Foss. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. That's what 
happened it's just it's just been a ride it's been an incredible ride since uh, the year 2000 uh, i've been building with electronics a little bit before that maybe around 5 6 years before that 96 97 95 or 96 or something like that so i've been been building with electronics way Same. before that and uh, i ventured into robotics because there was Uh, there was no venue for robotics then nobody was teaching robotics you could only go online and learn so i started learning online that's how i started off in the year 2000 so i had a lot of spare time that year and i was sitting down and pondering on what to do and i said okay let's make a robot and you know to be fair i think that's around the exact time i started too because i was doing electronics mm-hmm. since the mid 90s and then my first robot i think was also 2000 Oh, awesome. So that it's one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on is I'm like, oh, this guy's just like me. <laughs> so, it's a parallel story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a parallel story. They're like poetry, they rhyme. So. Yes. <laughs> so, so maybe maybe let's uh, uh uh go in reverse. That would I I think make yeah, a lot of sense to people. For sure. So, so like what are some of the things you're working on now that are like, you know. So, yes. So the journey interesting part of the journey starts right now so what i i am doing right now is doing a lot of uh big huge jumbo machines that uh do stuff autonomously so uh, uh so i i don't remember the movie which movie it was but i i, I think it was i robot in which uh uh when he's inspecting the house the uh, the the demolition robot comes and starts breaking the house yeah it's i robot i think i think yeah. that's i robot i haven't seen it in a while but that that sounds yeah, right i think it's i robot so we're building demolition robots and we're oh, building oh that's awesome <laughs> we're building compactors that work on their own and and uh, uh uh making tractors that can run run on their own do a lot of stuff so it's like uh uh Uh, reducing the need for uh what to say uh having uh, exact skills to do a lot of stuff together so instead of having just uh, uh the know how uh, knowing how to run a tractor or or let's say uh knowing how to uh, navigate the tractor p- properly or or let's say a weeding machine properly yeah or or uh, co- combine harvest properly you could just the the person who's handling it could just direct it to where it has to go and the remaining complexity ca- could be handled by very uh, uh low level machines that could uh, calculate all the distances and avoid obstacles and look at the uh, uh grains available and try try harvesting it according to the positions on the map so uh, that that's what we are trying to do we are trying to make uh, off highway machines autonomous and and to reduce the complexity in driving them and and reducing losses in in uh, agriculture and and construction and all that by having these machines on board that's awesome yeah i um i really really enjoy work in like the mining and construction sectors as well like it's yeah. you get to build really rugged stuff <laughs> so. Yeah. so so the smallest robot that we have uh we call it davis uh, which is davis uh Davis D A V I S right. So that's the robot that we test all our algorithms on Oh so nice it- <laughs> I think I see where you're going sorry I didn't mean to interrupt No worries so Davis is like a, a John Deere ta- tractor a, a 1990s John Deere tractor retrofitted with all Danfoss equipment to make it fly by wire and all that So it, it's it's the size of a car <laughs> and that is the smallest robot that we have that's awesome <laughs> and we are enjoying playing with it and and it, it's nice to make huge stuff move around like like having lego uh, nxt kits it's like it, it's very interesting it's exactly like a huge jumbo set of nxt then you're making it move and it does stuff and you just have to be safe around it that's the only only way of having fun around it you yeah. you design stuff you test stuff on it Let's say, for example, we are testing uh, a lot of algorithms on it, where it can navigate autonomously on uh, using GPS. It can avoid people. It can track people, or maybe follow people, and all that. So it can do a lot of stuff on on the uh, uh, on on autonomous mode, basically. That's awesome. 
It sounds like you guys might need some smaller robots. <laughs> like I imagine that thing's crashed a bunch. <laughs> we are. We are actually uh, actually vouching for smaller robots to start testing a lot of the stuff. But but the actual hardware itself is uh, the there are controllers that are running this. Uh, the the algorithms the, we need the controllers also there. So the controllers are oh, actually that meant, makes sense. Yeah, meant to go on big bigger machines. So we have our own uh, proprietary controllers which run all these algorithms there and we have a software that communicates to this and we have blocks that go. So you, it's easier for companies to build it. So that is where Danfoss comes in. So each company that is doing, let's say, uh, designing uh, of, of highway machines doesn't need to have its autonomy team. We will be their outsourced autonomy team. We build uh, stuff for them and we'll outsource them, uh, outsource the autonomy part for them. And oh. we have a huge team that does it. Which is why you're testing on a Deere machine is to be yes. able to show. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So the John Deere machine, it's it's the it's actually owned by uh, Danfoss. So it's actually not for John Deere. It's a machine that we use to test our hydraulics and controls on. So it's a machine that is all it's 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 kind of a demo machine, let's say. Yeah. For all the customers that are coming in, we, we do our demos on Davis. And uh, uh, I think the the uh, team in the U.S. has a soil compactor that they cool. run their demo on, and uh, we also have customer machines. So customer machines are basically the machines that they give, and we'll be fitting our our algorithm and and our machinery and electronics and everything into it. So that's how it goes. That's awesome. That's actually like a really good stopgap. So I, I was kind of joking when I said you might need some smaller robots. So. When I was working at Joy Global, we would develop on um, 12th scale miniatures of like big, you Not know, mining vehicles, but they were, they were small. Like you could, you could test them indoors, you know, in a lab, um, yeah. maybe like, you know, like as tall as a person crouching on like, on one of those vehicles. Um, okay. And so the control system was, were a little bit different. Um, they were all electric, but I think a lot of our full scale vehicles were electric too. Um, but you're right. If you're going from electric to hydraulic, I mean, it's just going to be more integration time getting the controls to work properly. And so, so we 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 are designing something. Our our US team is designing something for us to be able to use the same modules. So, uh, uh, so if you look at our robotics architecture, it's very scalable. So uh, you can design smaller robots or bigger robots with the same uh, ideology or or architecture. So we are designing a smaller robot. Uh, that can, that will have the same what to say nervous system of the bigger robot, so we can test everything on the smaller scale robot and yeah. then just transport the code to the bigger one. Yeah, that's one of my favorite ways to develop large robots, right? I mean, because now you can have a bunch of different autonomy teams trying out different algorithms at the same time on a bunch of smaller yeah. robots when yeah. maybe the full scale so assets the, the, millions of the dollars. The iterative part of robotics comes in when you have a smaller robot. So if you have a bigger robot. It's difficult to iterate or difficult to tune it to the uh, the the nuances that you want to tune it to. So when you have a smaller robot, you are, you're free to move it around. Maximum, if it hits, you don't get bruised. You, it just f topples over. So if you have a bigger robot, you have to be very safe and you're cautious all the time that the code has to run like that and all that. So you you can do a lot of iterative testing if you have a smaller smaller scale robot of the same. Yeah, scale. I agree. No, I, I use that methodology at work too. Um, big big fan. Uh, I started calling them test mules recently, uh, talking about the smaller <laughs> scale robots. So, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, gave gave a talk last night for uh, IEEE where I talked about that, and I'm like, you guys should all be building smaller scale robots. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. It's it's more fun. It's it's more what forgiving. It's uh, you you can run them around. The maximum you you lose is maybe a battery or something. Yeah, nothing more than that. Yeah. Well, and even if you lose the whole asset, like it's way less money than if you you yeah. know take out you know a full vehicle. Um, you know, which I mean, you're probably not going to lose that, but it's it's less catastrophic. Yes, but but having a machine like Davis running around gets your adrenaline running. So you're <laughs> Even if, even if, even if you're just just writing a code for line following, the the output is much larger. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Well, and I kind of agree. Like when you're working on a multi-ton robot, you know, of any kind, it's um, it is definitely uh, exciting and fun. Yeah. And I mean, you want to have your hand right over the e-stop, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> point to be noted yeah that's that's where you have your hand on so so we run all our vehicles or uh, uh, when we are testing out autonomy we have a remote control uh, equipment from danfoss itself that controls all these machines where you can switch them on and switch them off and so we have the e stop there also that's so awesome. something goes wrong we are, we we, are, we we just press it and the robot stops what happens if you lose signal to the to the remote controller? So, so the remote controller is uh, it's it's an industrial grade remote control. If you lose signal to the remote control, the robot stops. Nice. The robot doesn't. So it's it's like a dead man switch remote. So if uh, so, there are uh, a lot of things that the uh, uh, that are like uh, it's called functional safety. There are, there are a lot of safety systems that are running in the robot. If any of the safety systems goes offline, the robot stops. It will not move till it hears the heartbeat from the system. So that's how the that that's how critical the safety is. So uh, uh, what to say? Uh, in in comparison to a smaller robot, you will not have safety systems in a smaller robot. Yeah. But this robot already has a full nervous system that handles only safety. So if something goes wrong with the steering system and the steering feedback is not working, the system stops. If the engine has some kind of an error, the system stops. Uh, if if it finds that uh, the autonomy system is sending signals way faster, the system stops. So you have a lot of fail safes implemented into the safety controller. So that's how rugged and maybe what to say, uh, it, it, it's 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 an industrial standard. So it's like plug and play for a lot of stuff, uh, and it's been already thought about. So we are just developing the algorithm. So it's the uh, the functional safety is already built into the hardware. That's awesome. Yeah, and I mean, when you're operating at that scale, like it's you're right, it's a totally different consideration, and you, yes. you have no option because it's going to kill people if you don't build up yes, like that. Yes. And <laughs> and you have to be you have to be very critical of your safety, and you have to follow all the rules that uh, have been put put forward. And you, you sh I mean, it's fun and all, but you should take your safety to the uh, most seriousness. Yeah, I completely agree. I was kind of joking. I met a, I was meeting with a safety engineer the other day at work and, um, you know, I, I was meeting the guy for the first time and I said something on the lines of like, oh, your job is terrifying to me. And he's like, don't be terrified. I'm like, I'm not terrified of you. I would be terrified to make the wrong decision if I were you. Yes. Functional safety is something that we all need to have, but we, we, tend not to touch it because it's too scary. Well, the liability, right? I mean, like the implication of getting it wrong and, you know, like if you if you screw up. Um, so I, when I was a student, I built a, um, I want to say it was like an 80 kilogram robot. And uh -huh. um, it was, um, I didn't think to put an emergency stop on it because, you know, you don't, they don't teach you that in school. And so... You know, I um, I was working with this thing, and I mean, it was certainly big enough to break my leg. You know, it was, <laughs> you know, it probably couldn't kill me, but it could do some damage. And so um, it got out of range of a uh, custom remote control thing that we wrote for it that used, uh, I think it was like XB communication, and it got out mm -hmm. of range, and the motors just went into full forward. <laughs> oh, my God. And it went across a street of traffic, and I had to chase after it. And luckily, the lid was off at the time, and I was able to just reach in and I pulling wires, and I, I got the master disconnect, you know, and it didn't break my arm <laughs> while I was doing that. It's like pull the red wire when you're running. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? I think it was an Anderson power connector, and I had to, like, yank the whole connector out. So, but, so it'll be mechanically very tight to yank it when you're running. It's going to be very difficult. Well, if I'd have tried... Well, no, no, I jumped on it. I ran across the street. I jumped on the thing. I grabbed it, tried to hold it down with one hand and then, like, find the disconnect by feeling around inside because the lid was <laughs> off and, like, yank it out with the other hand. And so it was... Memories um, of, of switching a robot off. Every single it's robot I've built since then has an emergency stop on it. <laughs> yes, yep. You actually need an emergency stop. That's... I mean, uh, that's that's how you learn. I mean, the hard way. You you never forget how how important functional safety is. Once you go through a traumatizing uh, sequence of events, like. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever ex have an experience like that that kind of pounded it into your head? Oh, not just one. Maybe. <laughs>
<laughs> I've had I've had robots blow up. I've had robots start fires. I've had robots fall down. <laughs> I had robots that ran away because their motors were on, and so all has happened. So I mean, because they were smaller robots, I mean they were not 80 kg robots. I was still taking it up as not a very important thing to do because these were all smaller robots. So once once I moved into bigger robots, and the same started happening. That is when I start taking corrective measures of started doing. Functional st- safety design for them and having e stops and all that. So uh, thankfully, I didn't have to run behind an eighty kg robot. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a, a somewhat similar an eighty kg robot which which could crash crash into you and then we designed an e stop for it and we had the whole system on the e stop. But we we so our robot was not just uh, uh, what to say. Uh, uh, a thing that was just controlled with remotes so it had remotes plus it was running on autonomy so you couldn't cut it off abruptly so you could cut off the motors but you couldn't cut off the brain abruptly if you, oh, if you nice. cut off the main system then it would crash so we had to design around it so the main system would keep running but it would stop all the uh, functionality all the motors and everything for something like a safety controller for it we designed something yeah. and Once the e stop went, it it would stop all those parts. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I've I've kind of straddled those two decisions too. So I'm like, we have these small test robots uh, that we use for development that are like five kgs, and um, on those, the emergency stop just triggers a relay that turns everything off because they're so tiny. It's just you know, it. just to make it in it less expensive. It's it's simplified. Right. But on the larger ones, you know, I mean, it's like you said, you don't want to turn the brain off because then you lose communication. You've got to reboot the computer. I mean, you know, on the small and, one, and if it goes out of control, you can just pick it up. To, it's sometimes more dangerous to switch off the brain to, altogether. If you switch it off, you might lose a lot, lot more than just switching off the motors. Yeah, so it's, it's much more easier to just switch off the motors or maybe control, uh, stop the power from going into the power systems. Uh, rather than just switching the whole robot off. Yeah, I completely agree. And like anything, anything we have that's like a real project or larger scale does that. Because I mean, like you said, it, it, you can't even switch off the motors in certain robots, right? I mean, like think about like a dynamically balancing robot, where if you switch off the yes. motors, it'll fall over and potentially yeah. hurt someone. Yeah, exactly. So like it's it's kind of fun to think through those scenarios, and you know, like you know, what happens if you need to shut this off and. A person stuck underneath it, like you know, how do you get them out? You know, yeah. uh, you know. I mean, there's there's a bunch of different you know scenarios you've got to think about, and you know, it's all yeah. interesting conversations and heated philosophical debate with systems and safety engineering teams. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> edge case scenario: if the robot climbs on the stairs and falls on top of another person, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did you see that video of the uh, the one robot like falling down an escalator and like taking two people out? Oh no, no, no! I didn't see that. There's there's a video on YouTube, and I'll, I'll check it out after. But it, it's, I think it's in a mall in in China somewhere, and the the robot somehow gets like sucked into an escalator that is going down. And oh my God. yeah, like it just doesn't detect it, and it falls over, and it, it's maybe the size of like, um, like a large trash can. So it, it's not oh. small. It takes up the whole width of the escalator. Oh my and God! It, it, and, and it falls and over, and it falls all the way down, and like two people just fly up. Oh my God. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of humorous because it, it the whole thing looks pretty slapstick. But I mean, hopefully those people weren't seriously injured, didn't break any legs or anything. <laughs> but. Hopefully, the the team that designed the robot would take measures not for not that not to happen the next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, Design I'm sure somebody people. either got fired or like thought about very hard. You know, like the cliff sensor they had chosen or how their code worked or like the logic they use when they're near an escalator after that yeah. incident. Yeah, that it's that's another thing. Like, I have a friend at. Um, Pratt and Whitney, um, that company that makes aircraft engines, that talks about the newspaper test, and the newspaper test is, you know, if this were to happen, what would the headline be on newspaper tomorrow? <laughs> and if that's something you can live with, <laughs> then it's okay. 
<laughs> that's that's a great uh, test to do for any of your safety controls. What would be the test? Uh, what would be the news headlines the next day? Yeah, hopefully none. <laughs> you know, robot does its job. <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah, that's 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 about Dan Force. So, so it's been a, a month, almost two months now. Yeah, almost two months in Dan Force. The team is awesome. We have a, a jumbo team with a very small team in Denmark. So Denmark, we have uh, around five people right now. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. So we are working on the hardware, and most of the uh, remaining team is in the US, and we have another team in uh, India. Cool. So, so it's all over the globe. So we've got team team meetings going around. So you probably uh, never get to sleep then. <laughs> No, the, the the work life balance is awesome. That is what I have to uh, comment about the company. The work life balance is awesome. The company actually is very flexible with work timings and, cool. and family times and all that. And uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to set up the. Ba- I have a one and a half year old, so I, I've had to get him to get accustomed to the the weather. Plus, he he has just started going to play school, so. So we have to uh, stay back with him for the first few days and all that. So the company has been very accommodating with all that, and uh, uh, and and the rules are also like that. We we are very free to do uh, uh, work and family and balance it out properly. That's awesome. So we- I more meant like staying up late to do podcasts or meetings with the U.S. or. <laughs> You know, India or like all over the world. So, so but, they're they're, yeah. they're very very supportive in that sense. The when whenever the team, so the teams which are uh, like off uh, off our uh, the the on different time zones, they will, they will only uh, have meetings during the overlap of the time. Oh, that's time that's pretty awesome, actually. Yeah, that, that's really yeah. awesome. I mean, I've never uh, been able to do that with teams that are spread apart all over the globe. And they're able to balance all that with with the small amount of time overlap that we have, so we are very I mean synchronized properly, and neither are we I mean we don't have a what to say uh, that uh, tension or 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 let's say a uh, uh, lot of pressure to let's match up timeline time times and time zones and all that. We just have meetings in the amount of time that we have as an overlap. So. Uh, that that works out pretty pretty well. Right? That's awesome. So I mean, the reason I said that wasn't to disparage your employee. It's because I do that. You know, whenever I'm doing <laughs> so it. No, I've been doing that myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when when, when I was uh, I, uh, a short while before I joined uh, Dan Falls, I was running my own company, and I was I was running my company without any sleep. So I was like waking up like five five thirty in the morning and going to sleep Jealous. at two o'clock at night and doing all that. So All right, I so was not too far away from that. So because I'm running my own company, I do that now. But yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of comes with the job. I mean, running New Zealand your company to the East Coast comes with United some perks. Yeah, yeah. Running your company comes with some perks, but it also comes with a lot of responsibility. Yeah, so if you, agreed. If you enjoy that, it's a good good journey. But sometimes priorities change. I mean, I got married. I have a family. I have to look after the family. Before that, I didn't have to do that. I was just <laughs> I was just a single person, and I didn't have to look after the family, so I could spend all my time on robots. Yeah, that makes <laughs> now sense. Now I have a I have a very small robot running around in my house. <laughs> <laughs> He's like those vacuum cleaning robots. He'll just crawl into any any space available. Try not to hit his head and come out of the other side and and come to your leg and scratch your leg. Pick me up. Pick me up. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> so I call him the Mr. Vacuum Cleaner of my house. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I guess I guess that actually does make a lot of sense because I yeah. I do not have kids and I own a company, and so yeah. I am waking up stupid early and staying up stupid late in order to take meetings with whoever you know. And yeah, no, I mean I, I see it with a lot of my coworkers. Like like the ones that have kids have a different set of priorities than the ones that don't, and. So, so it's it's kind of I mean, running a company and having a kid are almost kind of the same responsibility. And I'm I'm kind of uh, very jealous of people who are able to time manage both of them together. It's it's kind of a, a great skill to have. I mean, 
I am not a person who is able to time manage everything together. So I have right now set my priorities up, and these are my priorities. But people who are able to do it up, I mean, I, I applaud them for having that kind of a, a focused mind set to it. That you wake up at this time, you you spend the time for your company, then you for your family, and then you go to sleep. So for me, I'm not maybe exactly a fully structured person. You could say. So I I have a lot of my life worked out, but I'm not a fully structured person to have everything balanced. <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Yes. Yeah, for me, the struggle right now is trying to find time to go to the gym. <laughs> I feel like it's it's my love. <laughs> it's it's it's, well, it's you know it's not that much of a struggle, but it's it's somewhat of a struggle and. Yeah. I just I mean, I, I, I've actually worked out an algorithm to do that. So if if you make any task, uh, what to say, interesting, you'll naturally start doing it. Is what I think. I mean, if 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 you make gym interesting, then you'll start going to gym autom- automatically. And if you feel gym is too much of a uh, what to say, chore, you you'll stop going to the gym. Is that what I think? So so how do you make uh, it interesting? I, like what's worked for you? I mean, I've never tried going to a gym. Oh, to <laughs> I, I would, I would take the gym membership, go there for three days, and stop going altogether. Yeah, no, that's then the, I don't try to do it. That's that's my struggle. <laughs> <laughs> it's not interesting. Like, I, I need to like have you know, I need to hire a trainer or like try to get a friend to go with me, so I feel like an asshole if I don't meet them. You know? <laughs> so right now, right now, I'm going through compulsory gym. So it's like the the place is uh, 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 Denmark is like a place for cycles and walking. So you have to compulsorily walk uh, at least two kilometers a day. So oh. to go to the bus stop. Yeah, or, you're fine. Or, or com- <laughs> coming back from home. So I'm like exercising in the naturalest possible way, the easiest <laughs> possible way. I'm I'm compelled to do the exercise. <laughs> yeah, because you got to get where you're going. <laughs> true, very true. So yeah. that's why I'm doing my gym. That's fair. No, I mean, like, I I have no issue like playing tennis or like doing rock climbing because those are fun. Yeah. So like, I'll I'll always get that exercise in because you know it's like I'm competitive. I like playing tennis. Uh, you know, the rock climbing is kind of a puzzle. You're like, I want to get to the top. How do I do yes. that? You know, and so that's kind of fun. Um, but then when it comes to just lifting weights for the sake of working out, like, yeah, it's just. I don't know. I think, it, it, I think there's it ways to make like it enjoyable. It, it, it feels like a waste of time to me also. It's like walking on the treadmill. I mean, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm just <laughs> walking. So now, now when I walk to the destination, okay, there is a destination and I'm walking. So it has some kind of sense or, or some kind of accomplishment once you reach there. Yeah. So whereas if you're walking on the treadmill, I started from here, I stop here and I walk six kilometers. And I've accomplished nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yeah. It's like a for loop that does nothing. Yeah, I think that's yeah, for sure. <laughs> just just a spin to delay your uh your system. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's that's probably how I think about it too, and, and that's kind of why I, I get in my own way in that regard is because I just can't you know, it seems non productive. Correct. So yeah. very true. So if you, if you give me a robot and tell, uh, I mean, tell me to program while you're running, I could do it, but I'm, I'm not running on the treadmill. I don't like to do it. (laughs) (laughs) That makes sense to me. Yeah. Cool. So what are some of the other cool robots you've, you've worked on over the years? Like, um, just, I don't know. So a few, uh, few months before I joined Danfoss, I was working on Omron's robots. We were building automation solutions for uh, packing uh, uh, medicines and all that, oh, cool. and we were using we were using the uh, uh, robot from Omron, which was called the TM5 900 robot. So it was 900 mm long, uh, 900 uh, mm long, 90 centimeters long, and it could pick up stuff. I think one one and a half two kgs, and then put it into boxes and all that. Oh, that's cool. So you, like a gantry yeah, we system, were... or uh, no, it was a robotic arm, uh, and uh, uh, so the, this was a cluster of robotic arms trying to package medicines and all that. Oh, cool! And, and into trays, so so that it's more efficient and and maybe more uh, productive, I would say. Yeah, it makes so sense. Instead of, so uh, instead of just 
making humans do the repetitive tasks, this, these robots would just keep doing one one thing again and again and again. So it was just too repetitive. So these were like, I think, three or four robots that were synchronized to each other. They were assembling stuff and they were putting it into the tray and all that. And uh, that was kind of a few months before I joined Danfoss. Uh, a few years before I've, uh, let's say, for, for example, last uh, five to six years, I've been actually working on developing platforms uh, for autonomous mobile robots. Uh, so this is when I had my own company. I was running my own company and we were designing autonomous mobile robot bases from around, I think, 2017. So we designed a lot of stuff. Uh, we built everything from scratch. Uh, we didn't go with off the shelf uh, platforms and just designing the uh, algorithms or anything. We got everything together. We started off with a very crude robotic platform with small ro small wheels, but a very big platform with a very small motor, uh, like a 2 kg motor or something like that. And then we started coding and we put encoders into it and we learned. And then we went back to the drawing board and put industrial motors and designed our own controller connected a ROS uh, computer to it. Oh, cool. Wrote, wrote a lot of the ROS code. I mean, uh, I mean, got all the ROS code working, I would say. I didn't, we didn't build a, a lot of ROS nodes per se, but we got everything working together. We had mapping, we had uh, navigation, we had uh, uh, odometry, everything built on the robot. Most of the stuff was scratch built. And we, we designed all the systems to be very safe and reliable and all that. And uh, we, we built a platform that was the finally, finally what came uh, from that is we designed a platform that was, I think, four and a half centimeters or five, five centimeters tall. Oh, wow. And yeah, it was, it was very slim and, yep. and it was, it was like a cassette and it would go below, it could go below, uh, uh, what to say, uh, 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 racks, it could go below racks and all that. So the oh, platform kind of like the Kiva the, platform, exactly something yeah. like the Kiva platform. But this this had uh, 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 what to say? It 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 was not based out of uh, let's say uh, the Kiva platform has QR code stickers on which this rides. So we didn't require any kind of infrastructure. It, it had a built navigation and a mapping uh, uh, system on board, so you could just plug it into any environment, map the environment and tell it to go to any any location in that environment without any infrastructure. You doing that with a SLAM then, I'm guessing? Yes, we nice. were doing it with <laughs> we, we had a SLAM node inside that and we were building the map and all that and we were doing uh, something called as, I think, a cartographer, if I'm not wrong. We were using the cartographer mapping uh, uh, node for that and we were doing it. And then, uh, then slowly, slowly, when we had the physical platform ready, we found that uh, uh, a robot is not just the hardware or the firmware. You also need to make it productive. To make it productive, you have to make it communicate to people who are not actually robotics people. You have to speak the language of the robot to the robot, and you have to speak the language of the person to the person. So the person who is using it need not understand what the robot, uh, ro how the robot is being programmed or how it communicates and all that. He needs to be able to communicate to the robot in the most intuitive way. So what is the most intuitive thing uh, that we've used? We've used, we've all used a touchscreen phone or a tablet. So we designed our ecosystem or, or the user interface, user experience on that tablet. And we designed it to uh, emulate very close to our maps, a Google map or, 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 or uh, 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 what to say, uh, Apple maps. And we would just show the map exact map of the floor plan and the person could just point on the map and tell tell the robot to go there which was the easiest thing to do then we started developing making it more intuitive because we needed to read out the battery voltages and needed to know when the robot needed to go to charge so we made it very foolproof so that is that that is what i did for the last six years when i was running the company that's developed awesome the, the, developed the robot developed the user interface found a way to interact with the ROS ecosystem with, with the tablet and made it very uh, user-friendly and reliable. That's really cool. Was that like an internal product that your company was working on or was that something you yes. were doing for a client? Okay, nice. 
that was an internal problem. So we had two products when uh, uh, in in the uh, mobile robotics uh, ecosystem. We had a robot that was uh, holo holonomic. Basically, it could it, it didn't have it, it it didn't have a front or a back. It could go in any direction. Yeah. So we had a robot that was designed on a mechanism wheel platform. Nice. Yeah, so those we, are fun. We designed uh, that, that, that. Those are awesome when they run. When they do a motion, yeah, you could do on difficult terrain, of... it doesn't really work because you get those little wheelet jammed up, and yes, uh, yes, like you can only yes. really use them in labs. Yes, and and you had to work out all those mechanical problems also before you got the remaining thing running. So if you had a differential drive robot, uh, putting a suspension on it would be the simplest thing to do. But if you have a mechanical wheel robot, oh, have interesting. <laughs> Yes, it's a it's a really interesting problem to do. I've never and tried when, to put suspension put, on mechanum wheels. <laughs> yes, if you put suspension on mechanum wheels, your your uh, kinematics change, your 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 distances change, your your mechanics, uh, all your mechanics change. So you almost need like series elastic passive suspension or active suspension in order to make yes. that work. But that's yes. a lot of math. I mean, like to math. yeah to vector that into so we, the wheels. We found out a shortcut to that. <laughs> We designed uh, an interesting, uh, this was an interesting perspective that I had. We designed something called as a compliant mechanism, compliant chassis. So the, the chassis would actually twist and turn to to take the, uh, what to say, uh, unevenness of the ground, I would say. The robot was very heavy. And uh, so we, we had designed the robot so that it could twist a few few mm's on each side. Oh, interesting. So instead of having... Uh, uh, mechanical suspensions the whole robot would actually twist and turn to adjust to the terrain. how did you do that so we <laughs> we designed a lot of our uh, uh platforms on something called as fusion 360 and okay. we had used that to mechanically model all the loads and uh, uh, uh things on the robot and we we designed the uh, the internal struts or the welding braces in such a way that it would twist in the wanted direction and not twist in the unwanted direction. Oh, that's it. So you had like joints and linkages that would, would be able to move. Okay, that's yes. cool. I, I thought you might have used like a non-rigid material or something. No, no, yeah. no. We, we used a rigid material, but uh, we we designed the the thing to be, I mean, compliant enough. We It wouldn't just fold over. If you pick it up, it's a solid piece. But when you have load and it's on the ground, it would twist enough to just have all four wheels contacting the ground. Oh, that's cool. So we had designed that and it, it worked and we were running it. And then uh, that was called, uh, the, the platform was called Hero H-I-R-O. It, it, the, the robot had a humanoid on top. So it was called a humanoid intended for robotic operation. But yeah, yeah no, I remember seeing the video of that. That thing is awesome. Uh, that was yeah. That was a really, really cool project, I thought. Yeah, and I mean the the amount of design that went into the humanoid chassis too, like that was that was super impressive to me. I didn't yeah. realize the chassis was compliant. <laughs> no, the the the, the 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 chassis at the bottom was compliant. The top part was all made out of this thing, uh, fiberglass. Yeah, it looked like fiberglass. Yeah, it was fiberglass and it was polished and painted with the automotive paint so that it could glow and all that. So it was really nice. The product was once you saw it in front of you, it was really professional grade uh, hard, hardware that we had designed. So that was the first product. The second one was called the app, the one that looked like the Kiva platform. And what was it uh, called again? Uh, it was called ARC, A-R-C. Got it. Uh, so it, it was called the Autonomous Robotic Carrier. Nice. So so these are all short forms that we sat down as a team and fo found out just before launching the product. So you just sit down and think of really nice names and come up with uh, uh, really nice short forms for them. Yeah, those those whiteboard sessions are fun. Like, yes. Did you ever end up with? I, I I feel like you must have. Like, I feel like every time I do a session like that, where I'm trying to name a product or a company, like yes. you always end up with a bunch of joke ones. Like, um, yes, yeah, <laughs> we did, we did. And and our team was like sitting down and just making funny names, and then yeah. we, we land up on a good name. And sometimes the acronym is nice, but the full form is not nice. Sometimes the full form is nice, but the acronym is not nice. And then, then we sit down and, and change words around and then get a good 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 acronym and name. So so ARC was the platform. So ARC was the platform that was meant to 
uh, be what to say like a, a plug and play for a few products together so you could convert it into a rack carrying robot by just having nothing on top so you could have top modules and the bottom module will be where all the batteries and the brain is you could design whatever top, top modules you wanted according to the use case the, that you had so this would reduce let's say a lot of uh, uh, let's say uh, overheads to have uh, if we had three or four robots in in the market we needed to have only a, a set of three or four spare spare parts because all the robots use the same uh, internals that's pretty so awesome that was, yeah that, that was basically designed to make servicing easy also so we had thought about how servicing would be handled or how redundancy would be handled let's say for example if we have 10 different robots with 10 different motors and 10 different uh, controllers then we need to have spares of all those uh, if anything goes wrong whereas if you have the same hardware in most of them and just slight differences then you don't need to have a lot of spare parts to service all the robots yeah it's like unifying the fasteners on a robot so that you don't have Correct. to carry a whole bunch of different ones Correct. Exactly. Exactly. That is the same ideology that we stuck to for that robot. And uh, we were designing um, uh, a lot of different platforms on top, which could carry crates. We could we could carry, uh, let's say, food items and all that. So it was compatible to that. The core core uh, uh, robot would do slam and would do mapping and would have all the algorithm and the tablet to control it. And on top of that, you could build any platform. What were you um, using for your uh, for your perception sensors for the uh, the slam? Uh, so we started off with the uh, a two D lidar, which was called the RP lidar. I RP think LIDAR. it was the first model of the RP lidar A one. I think. I think A1. I remember that. I've never integrated that into something. So oh, it's, a, it's a neat uh, uh, sensor. It, even though it's low cost, it's pretty robust. It is rugged and e even with dust and everything it actually gives you a good reading oh, that's cool and it, uh, when when uh, we started off with that because it was low cost we started off Makes and we thought that we'll, we'll switch to a more premium sensor when we have a product in in mind so we we ran uh, the testing throughout the testing of let's say two years or two and a half years not even a single sensor broke down so we we understood that those sensors were reliable and even during rugged testing meaning in in when we are testing we would just plug it out plug it in and and let's say pick it out and we will not take care of it because we are just moving it around with all that moving and shaking and all that the sensor remained in one piece and it it kept on giving what it was meant to do it would just switch on properly and keep running and running and running it was very reliable i would say so we at the end also we stuck to that product only even though we thought it might be too too cost effective but it was it was it was not made cheaply it was a rugged piece of equipment that's interesting i've i've kind of gone the other way before and had it bite me where i try to go for an expensive sensor and like it seemed good but had poor driver support i got burned on some imus that way um okay. and then I've also gotten burned. I mean, as, as we all have, where you start with too cheap of a sensor and then you spend all these extra hours trying to get it to run and, Correct. you know, you can get it going eventually and you might need to build some calibration jigs or whatever, but you know, it's, it's, but worked. this, this was like the exact midway. It was, uh, it had the right kind of support. It had all the libraries and everything that we could just get running. We never spent even an hour setting up. It was all ready to go. We just, sat down and worked on all the other stuff other than the sensor the sensor had all the files that we wanted it to run so we never found it difficult to run anything uh the only time i had an issue with the sensor is yes that was just a single issue all over i think i've been working with rp lidar for roughly four five years now i think four or five years since it came out in the market it sounds like i should and be using those too Sorry. Yeah, and 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 I actually have only come across one small error, and that was I think a slight documentation error because of which uh, so ROS one uh, in ROS one when you look at the lidar, the lidar has its uh, X and Y oriented towards its front, and ROS two it has towards its back or something uh. like that. There was a very very slight issue in its frame of reference. That's all. 
so that was not documented properly so we had to just run it and see what is left and what is right yeah. so the x and y was flipped over or something like that there was just a small issue that makes sense but if you're building a product and once you figure that out and you're able to move past it and thank you for telling yeah. me by the way and all the people listening then uh, you're in way better shape and and you know like i mean sometimes you know you have some of those pains but like that that doesn't sound like the worst thing in the world to contend with especially no. once you no. get it solved no so so it is one of the products that i've worked with that has uh, never quit i would say most of the products actually after my kind of testing they they actually quit after two or three days i mean i i'm actually throwing them around putting them <laughs> into janky platforms and all that and this this also i've tried all those things i've actually kept them on books tilted and trying to write the code for it and still they 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 were pretty rugged i mean uh, i've had them sh- sitting on the shelf for maybe 3 4 months and uh, catching dust and i was like this is not going to run i took it and just plugged it in dusted everything off and it was running oh and that's awesome uh, that's that's how products should be built i mean not too costly not too cheap and on the midway with good documentation yeah. so that's kind of product that, that i look up to i mean those are the kind of products that should be there in the robotics market more instead of sitting down and repairing the product you should be doing what the sensor is doing and then tinkering on your product not yeah, yeah product. exactly well and, and i mean it is easy to like you know chase that or maybe not easy but easier i would say to just be like we're just going to use the most expensive lidar we can find and yeah. that's going to solve all the problems but if you're able to find like you said something that's like middle of the road and like gets the job done without spending you know the billion dollars or whatever yes like, i mean that's that seems like the way to do it yes yes and uh, uh, that that's kind of one very uh, nice product story that i have in in all the different products that i've used so there 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 are more costlier products in the market but sometimes the documentation is not there just like you said you take it and then you think that okay why did i buy this yeah. why did i spend this much why money you like you said you're spending all your time chasing after making the product that you bought work instead of using it as a building block into your own Correct. your own thing Correct. Correct. so so that was the sensor that we started with we uh, even tried integrating one of those depth sensors the depth cameras from intel I think Intel four three five D four three five. I think. Yeah, the the real sense uh, the four. It, yeah, real sense. One of those Bosch I am using it, but you could buy it without it. Yeah. Yes, yes. The the D four three five I had an IMU, and D four three five didn't have an IMU. That's right. So yeah, these were the two models. So there there were multiple models going around, but uh, Intel was very finicky with its product lineup. It was yeah. Like, it, it it seemed like there it was, was an, coming and then going and then coming and go, going right. and one day it just stopped. Yeah, well, I think they brought it back. I don't think they actually cut supply chain, if that's what you're talking about. But I, are you talking about the stability of like a real sense <laughs> on a USB, like going out and then you have to power cycle the whole bus? No, 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 not that, yeah. not that. The the supply supply thing initially, uh, they had another model, Intel Real Sense. Uh, I forgot. The original one was a bluish colored. A uh, long sensor that would give you depth data, and the problem with that was, I think the real sense team was very small, or either they were not investing a lot into the team. They came out with a mediocre product. Then the supply all altogether stopped one fine day, so we could never integrate that into a production uh, pipeline. Meaning we sense. never knew that if they were coming or not coming, and and maybe two years down the line they all altogether all stopped the product lineup. Uh, all together now. Now I I don't think uh, the real sense lineup is there. I thought they were still making them for some reason. Like you still see them in a lot of robots, but maybe they're okay. Maybe they're, might be, I might think be I think just... like I I heard like a year or two ago that they were discontinuing it, and then this is all through the grapevine. So I might be wrong, but like like six months ago or like three months ago, I heard that they were like back again and they were making them. And so, uh, they've like, been doing this for the last last six <laughs> five six years brutal on and off I, I, nobody's able to confidently in, integrate their product because yeah well on the documentation no, no yeah like you said can be a little bit lacking there too you know and yeah. i mean we had an issue where we tried to put a like seven of them on an nvidia and it just bobblenecked the usb and it didn't work <laughs> you know it was a yes. mx 
so maybe maybe too much too many features with too little testing i would say yeah well and then i would say like it had this issue with stability um or maybe has i don't know if they fixed it yet but like the USB would go out, and I, I think this is an issue with a lot of USB stuff. Like the USB uh, would go oh, out, and oh, then it would become oh, unstable, and you had to like yes. power cycle. If you really yes. nailed Intel I think, down, I on think it. I've also fixed it. So the USB that uh, these cameras used are those USB 3.0s with wider necks. I mean, uh, on one side you will have your normal USB A type. But on the other side, you will have a very wide connector with the screw with, terminals on the sides. Not the screw terminals, but but it's a little bit wider. The ones that go into your hard drives, just yeah. like the ones that you have on your hard drives. So they are a little bit high speed things. But I think these sensors were prone to overheating. So the 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 thermal thermal design for the PCB was not uh, very efficient. So they were overheating and throttling down or switching off or something like that. So we've also had a few issues like that. So they were they were not very reliable to put on a production robot. Yeah, that makes you a lot of sense to me. Yes. So when, when you're investing a lot of money into that sensor and maybe R&D into getting that sensor integrated with your robot, you want to be confident that the sensor is going to, uh, on the field, it's not going to give itself up. And yeah, correct. Just so, so we had to drop that sensor, but we were doing, we were trying to do uh, depth maps and all that with it and try to map uh, the... 3D environment with the cloud point cloud that it was giving. We we're trying to do that, but uh, we didn't. We, I mean, we had to shut shop. So then the Corona hit, and we we actually shut shop during that uh, uh, Corona season. So, but but I think uh, there are a few few other companies that have uh, uh, good products in the this depth camera region. And what do you there, think there of the, are, the Z cam? Uh, I'm actually not very familiar with it. I've actually heard about it being used in drones, uh, but I, I've never used them uh, in actual. Yeah, that's same. Like I haven't worked with it yet. Um, you know, um, I don't know. Might might be coming up on a project involving it, and so I'm just kind of curious. But um, I've heard good things from a lot of people. Like I've not heard a whole lot of stability issues or, or problems with it. Um, but yeah, I, uh, TBD. <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll trade TBD. notes in a few months. So the, the companies, the, the the companies that are working on it are actually fully focused on it. So the companies don't have any other product in their portfolio. They they're just looking at depth cameras. So they're just looking at sensors that do depth mapping and point clouds and all that. So they're very focused on the area of interest that they have. And uh, I think Z Z is one of those. Uh, companies that is also trying to make it lighter that is why most of the drones have them yeah so the other cameras are a little bit on the heavier side i would say so these are like a little bit lighter to carry as a payload so you will have multiple cameras looking down and up and all that and they'll create a map for the environment that's awesome what are some of the other camera companies you're interested in so for me i've, I've been hearing good things about framos but i haven't had a chance to integrate one of theirs yet uh, okay. I think it's based on the same chip as the real sense, but it's got a like gigabit Ethernet interface on it, which uh -huh. to me seems like a huge improvement because that USB yes. was was a major failure point on that thing. And so the communication line was a major major fa failure point. Even even if you are doing USB, I I don't think it will be a failure point if you design it properly or or maybe uh, failure test it to see where it is going wrong and redesign those parts, overheating or whatever. But but if you if you uh, look at the industrial side, maybe a gigabit Ethernet is much more interesting. So there is this another company that is doing uh, uh, lidars that do similar stuff, which is called Ouster. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Ouster uh, hardware is pretty rugged. Uh, they are meant to be. I mean, some of their sensors can even be pressure washed, so you can just fit it into any car and uh, have it ready for the industry or 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 the for uh, certification of the shelf itself. So the sensors are meant to be just plug and play. That's awesome. Ouster is there. Then then you have uh, there's another company called uh, SICK S I C K, which is also doing lidar stuff. Uh, camera. I'm actually off the top of my head. I don't remember the companies, but there are a few that are right now hot in the market. Yeah. 
Sick's been a thing for a while. Like the Field Robotics Center and like the National Robotics Engineering Center where I live have been using sick cameras or sick lidars like for I want to say like since the nineties. You know, like yeah, yeah. Sick, sick is a, a big player. The only problem is they are a bit on the pricier side, so it's very difficult for people who are doing on the hobby hobby side of it to go invest into something like that. So yeah, that but I don't would, know if like a hobbyist can afford an ouster either. Like they, those are no, not, not not even ouster. Yeah. Ousters are also meant for the industry only. Yeah. So they they are actually looking at a very different segment of the market, which is uh, industry and and uh, what to say certification ready. You can just plug it into their uh, uh, into your own product and not worry about getting those sensors certified. They're already certified and you can start going to the market. So that's one thing. Uh, then uh, now the cameras are the cost of cost and the technology wise also technology overhead is coming down for these depth cameras. So instead of uh, uh, a lot of people not uh, are not going into the what to say the lidar part. These have a bit of a better resolution when it comes to depth mapping. They are not as reliable as uh, lidar uh, cameras. I mean uh, lidar depth maps are. But they have a better resolution when it comes to images. Then they they also give you one more uh, layer of information, which is color. So the lidar is able to give you reflectivity. Some of the lidars are able to give you reflectivity and distance of the point, and uh, which is x, y, z, and uh, intensity. But if you look at the depth cameras, they give you uh, R, G, B, and x, y, z. Uh, together so yeah. that's basically one more uh point of interest the color of the point also is there yeah so you can do a lot of other filtering if you want to do color filtering or open cv stuff on the lidar uh, on the depth map you can do that yeah but i guess you could like extrinsically calibrate a rgb camera to a lidar if you wanted to do it that way too i mean yeah, yeah you can do that, do that. Uh, you can actually ma match it to it and you can do uh, sensor remapping but so this what happens with when you're doing that is you either need to have a secondary computer that does this or you will be overloading your computer with with parallel processing of uh, doing sensor fusion yeah. so where where the uh, the these cameras actually been over is they are actually doing all the sensor fusion and just giving you the cloud point cloud that's awesome so it's it's uh, less of a computational overhead when it comes to just having the cloud and then uh, working on the cloud rather than just integrating the data and getting a new cloud is a lot of computational yeah. all those points need to be calculated so uh, computational a reduction of computational overhead is something that everybody is working on so uh, each of the modules which you can separate like the sensors and the uh, what to say uh, the motor drivers or the uh, the drive systems all are actually offloading their minute amount of computing onto their systems. So say, for example, all the sensors now have their own brains. They will only give you the Im uh, amount of information that you require, actual information that you require. So you need to do very less amount of post-processing. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's been a thing for a while. I mean, like, I don't know if you remember the CMU cam from like the early yeah. 2000s. Yeah. yeah. So that yes. was like an early version of that with classical computer vision, and it would find like Correct. centroids of a color and like, threshold um you know but it was still offloading your compute so you didn't have to exactly so the CPU model using. had all all processing done on its own chip and yeah. it would only give you the centroid of the object that it is exactly yeah. yeah or like so servo your servo to tilt in the direction of or, or, or whatever right. but you're right they've gotten so much more advanced now i mean the fact that you can do you know like point cloud generation from a stereo pair and then map it to rgb all with an asic in a thing right. i mean is it's incredible right. i mean it's it's been a game changer yeah, and and uh, on on the same thread of sensors, the the drones are going a long way with these sensors on board. They can now, uh, I mean, if you if you look at path planning for a two dimensional robot, it's way less computationally heavy than if you look at it from a, a drone perspective. So the drones are now getting much more. It's it's like oh, that's I mean, interesting. Okay, yeah, it's getting interesting and it's also getting scary. The drones can do a lot of stuff. They can actually navigate through dense forests very easily. They can just uh, zigzag around and just go through the dense forest, which is even difficult for a human being. So they've developed yeah. algorithms that can do that at a 
very small amount of computational power. That's wild. I mean, I've heard that it's still difficult to detect like thin diameter branches. I, I, I'm not working on these problems personally, so I, I, I'm going off a of hearsay here. But like power yeah. lines and thin dimension uh, diameter branches yeah. apparently are still yes. an obstacle for drones, like pretty bad yes. just because yes. of the resolution. So, so they, they, they're, they're trying to battle that also. They are actually trying to battle that with a lot of AI integration into it so that a lot of stuff can visually oh, so be infer, identified. Huh? They infer the existence of something Correct. thin based Correct. on that. Yeah, that's interesting. Correct. So they're doing that. And and uh, now uh, even, even the DJI drones have a lot of brain power into it so you 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 can be tension free when you're flying it they they don't crash into any any obstacles and they can cross navigate not just stop there if you're taking a video footage and uh, it thinks that it's going to crash it'll just take another route and go oh, that's so it awesome. can replan its path trajectory basically i was driving one of those the other day um that like a buddy from the field robotics center let me drive and uh didn't crash his drone but uh yeah. It was it was really really easy. I mean, I remember like years ago trying to fly an RC helicopter and like it's it was very difficult. very very difficult. Very, but, like very the difficult. drones like the, it just it's stupid simple. Like it's basically flying itself now. So that's basically the 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 same ideology that I was coming to basically with robots. You remove the difficulty out of talking to a robot or a drone you found it difficult to maintain the altitude of a drone or a helicopter because for you, you had to take feedback and then control the altitude. Whereas you already know that the altitude has to be very stable. You build in all the logic into the uh, helicopter or the drone to hold the altitude and you don't have to think too much. Yep. You're basically <laughs> offloading your processing from there to the uh, drone itself. It's again, the same, same ideology. So for, for robotics, uh, uh, having a very good software or a user interface is the uh, is a big requirement. Yeah, uh, having a very powerful and useful and mechanical robot makes no sense if your user is not able to use it. Yeah, I completely agree. So it's like having a a, a, a Ferrari with no steering. <laughs> That's the basic or, idea. Or that you have yeah. to steer with a crank. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have, you have a Ferrari, but you cannot steer it. It just goes wherever it wants. So yeah. you need to be able to communicate what the user wants in the simplest possible way to the robot. That is the uh, easiest analo an analogy I can give you, uh, having a steering on a robot. So you have to be able to convey it in the easiest possible way for, for the person who's using it. He, if you If you tell him to learn a programming language or... Uh, tell him to understand the ecosystem is difficult. You make it as easy as possible and re remove the difficulty out of the equation and he'll start learning on its own. So uh, you give it to an eight-year-old and he should be able to drive it. That is my litmus test for any product. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so the product user, user interface should be as easy as giving it to an eight-year-old and him being able to do it off the top of his head. That's a very design-forward way of thinking about it. Um, yeah. What... Where, what got you to start thinking about things in that way? Um, I have my own reasons, but I'm curious to hear yours. Uh, mine is, I, 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 I mean, when I was running my company, I, I was thinking about a lot of products and why they didn't succeed. And I, I mean, I'm a person who takes a lot of feedback. So even if I fail, I take a feedback and, and try to implement it and correct it. That's the kind of person I am. So even during product design, I was looking at why products were failing or why why even though the market had good amount of players, they were not able to enter the market. So this got me into thinking the products were good, the use cases were good, the 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 customer was not able to use it because the learning curve for the software or learning curve for the training module was steep. Yep. Why not make it simple enough for any person to use it or or let's say coming back to the same thing, why not make it as easy as an eight year old can use it without a lot of training, maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes of training and yeah. he should be able to use it and make it as close to possible as what you've been using for a long time. You've been using your touchscreen phones for a huge amount of time. So you're very familiar with the ecosystem and, and you're familiar with all the interactions and the gestures and all that. Why not use the same same uh what to say platform to communicate with your robot 
and in the same way that you do with your mapping software or or your app you just need to have buttons that can do it let's say for example uh, if if i had to save a map and me going into ross and uh, uh, writing a command on command line ross save map and all that instead of that just giving a button that could do that on the background in the background yeah. it will be doing doing the same thing but it will be doing it in such an easy way that i also don't need to remember the command so i'm a person yeah. who forgets all the commands i i write down same. the commands as a cheat sheet and yeah. i will just copy and paste it so i don't rem- remember it off the top of my head i made it to save myself time i just made a button that could do it just press a button and save a map yeah. so why not do it for everybody yeah no, compl- I- completely agree i mean even like turning some robots on is like you know a task yeah a task like where you're like you have to you have to open four command line windows you have to type this command into this one then this one to this one then this one to this one then this one in that order you're like we yes. should have a batch script this is ridiculous yes. and link that to a button you know yes <laughs> like, exactly so it should be as easy as just pushing a button and it should boot up and all the things should be running because you know you want to run a robot on it and uh, somebody sitting down and pressing buttons and turning knobs in a particular sequence is going to be very difficult rather than just giving him a single button to press and the whole sequence runs on its own yeah kind of like the backup recorder in this podcast studio correct exactly <laughs> from the beginning, that's what i've been telling you just take a button and put all the script into that button and when you press that button everything runs i completely agree <laughs> uh, and we're working so, on implementing that <laughs> so so uh, when when you look at things uh, even even the the uh, backup computer concept so when you look at that thing initially getting it running would take you a lot of time but when you are doing this on a daily basis it would initially it might take you a full day to maybe set up a batch script and and try to work out a procedure for this which is just a single button uh, start but once you have that running it will be pain free for you you just come you just press a button and maybe 2 minutes after that everything is running for you yeah i i can there's a lot agree. of time in the long run initially you might have to uh, uh what to say ha- have to have a little bit more commitment and commit your one whole day into getting this run running but finally it will save you loads and loads of time yeah yeah no that so, makes sense so that's that's been the core ideology that i've been sticking to even if when i'm programming even when i'm de- developing products even when i'm doing my daily tasks it's like if i invest i mean if i'm doing this on a regular basis if i'm doing this daily or maybe every two days why not automate it or make a system for automating it that would make it more efficient or find out a procedure that would make it more systematic and finish it off yeah is what i think about yeah. uh, i agree i completely agree yeah that's that's what motivated me to put in this uh the stream deck for studio automation <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yep. So, yeah, no it's 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 definitely worth doing. Um it's uh one of my friends kind of has this philosophy which he's like, you know, spend an hour every day trying to figure out how to make your own job more efficient. Correct. And exactly. yeah. Same yeah. philosophy here. Yeah. I got to get better at that. I I feel like I I I believe it in principle and I just don't employ it as much as I should. So, True. yeah. Awesome. Well, I I think that's a great note to end on. Um and uh it's been a pleasure having you on Pratish. Thank you for coming in and Same uh, here. It's been awesome talking to you. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's awesome talking to you. Um yeah. And for everyone listening, thanks for making it this far. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Kraus is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Kraus is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.